Welcome to the second part of our transformation matrix tutorial. Today, I will show you how to transform not only the position, but also the rotation of your object, and extract that via the full transformation matrix. In the last tutorial, we did that with this object here that I've prepared for my building generator, which is currently in development. You can watch a little preview right here if you want. However, we faced a problem when we had a rotated object. We extracted a transformation matrix with the match axis node to place our object at the origin and move it later back to its place, but we could only store the position and not the rotation. That is due to the operation of the match axis node, which is actually only handling the position of our objects and not the rotation. That being said, I will show you two ways today in which you can add the rotation values to our matrix. One way with the bounding box node and one complete way with the attribute wrangler and a little bit of coding where we'll define and extract our full axis first, one by one, and then build our transformation matrix manually. But first, let's do the workflow with the bounding box. So what we have here is our object that we want to manipulate on the origin, and then transform it back to its place where it belongs. This is the bounding box we have here as a representation of our object, but it's not oriented properly. Luckily, we have the option to do that with the checkbox, orient bounding box. Great. And like the match axis node, we also have the same opportunity to extract our transformation matrix like that. Now with the benefit of the oriented box and therefore the rotation values. The only thing left is to transfer the matrix back to our initial object like this with an attribute transform. Disable primitives and points, enable detail, and transfer the matrix back to its object. Then we will need an attribute for the wrangler to do the same operation that we did last time. We say position is multiplied with the inverted version of our matrix. We add the at for the attribute. And because in our case we have a 4x4 transformation matrix, we need to specify the type 4. Hit enter, and we have our object aligned to the origin. And now we have of course the problem that it is not perfectly aligned like you might want it. But it's somewhat oriented correctly, so you probably can model it comfortably and transform it back to its place with another attribute wrangle. Let's assume you made changes to the object, get another wrangle, and basically repeat the vex line, but without the invert. And it should be back in its place again. That is one way to do it, if you're fine with not having full control over your alignment. And if you have a problem with that, and you want it maybe flat on the ground like that, or like that, we need to specify our matrix manually. At least it's the way I do it in Houdini. Maybe there is another sophisticated way, some AI figuring out how I want my object laying out, but I'm more of an old school guy, so let's do this. Just move these nodes over here to make us a bit more space to work. So what we will basically do here is select some primitives that are aligned along each axis, but we'll do that just to have only their centroids to work with. Therefore we get our beloved extract centroid to make points in the middle of our primitives. Later, we will access them with vex, or to be precise, we will extract their positions, subtract one from another to have the direction, and repeat that for every one of our three axes to then build our complete transformation matrix. Because partial transformation matrices are so last season, right? That was a bad one. Let's move on. So what I'm doing here is I just use a blast node to select two primitives for each axis here. One for Y, one for X, and another one for Z. Then extracts the centroids for each of the selected primitives and change the run over to primitives. You could also select some points instead of the primitives and save some time with extracting the centroids. Let's select these nodes, merge them in our attribute wrangle, and let's clean up our network a little bit, because no one likes a messy network. And what I'm doing then is extracting the centroid from our base object, because we do need also the center for the matrix. We can be a little bit more accurate with that and make a point at the end or beginning of our object, like on the bottom to have our center later positioned in a way that our object is oriented in the positive. But I am too lazy for that. Just connect the extracted centroids to the second, third, and fourth input. For the fun part, let's begin with the center. And in that case, the center is our point's position. So let's just write at P. Then we need our next axis that we are building it from a second input as a vector. And pay attention to the point numbers, accessing point zero and the point one for the second vector. Keep in mind that it is helpful to think about the axis and how we will describe them, like where we want to have the X, where it makes sense to have the Z and the Y axis. It's not a problem if you don't have them perfectly because later on, you can swap the order and values like you want, 
maybe making it a bit harder to read when your X identifies in fact as a Z axis. But it's perfectly fine for you when you keep that in mind. Let's move on and subtract one from another, so we end up having the actual direction. Let's write capital Z, and we immediately normalize it because otherwise, we end up with tiny and inconsistent values, resulting in a weird stretch of our object in the end, if we are not normalizing it. Let me bind the capital Z variable to an attribute to show you in the spreadsheet what I mean. If I simply subtract them without normalizing, we will end up with completely different values. So let's change it back. We can then just copy these three lines of vex and paste it. It makes sense to comment the lines if you write code. It is so much easier to understand what you did after a couple of weeks or months. And you can hit Alt-E to expand the vex interface. It makes it a bit easier to write the code. Just copy and paste the three lines, change the attributes, add the y-axis here from that, and we can visualize it directly to see if it's working. And it is, in fact, working. Add the last one, also copy and paste it like before, and change it to x. Let's make an attribute from the center, bring another attribute wrangle in, where we will combine all values and all vectors to our transformation matrix. At this point, we could transfer the vector attributes over to our object, but it seems a bit too much to transfer all the attributes like four vector attributes and its values on each point, and it just seems to be too much. So, let's stick to the attribute wrangle and have them as a variable instead of full attributes, because we're building a transformation matrix, not a puzzle. So let's try to make it as simple as possible. Later on, we only need one attribute, and this is the actual matrix itself. The first step is to bring our axis vectors in, which sounds like a term from a sci-fi movie, like, Captain, we need to bring in the axis vectors to stabilize the warp drive. Anyway, let's write another three vectors for X, Y, and Z, and copy and paste it three times. Don't forget to delete the little X at the end if you copied that like me. Change the name of the last one to center, and now we can finally build our matrix. You can call it whatever you want, but I call it just M. In order to build the matrix, we can use the set function here, fill in the axis X, Y, and Z, and we end up with the center at the end like that. We're basically done with this step, but we still need to do one more thing. When we check our spreadsheet, we can see we have a bunch of values for our matrix M. In fact, we have 16 different values, starting at M0, and you will notice immediately a pattern here. We have one at M3, M7, M11, and M15, instead of similar values to the others. This is not a coincidence, it has a system to it. To make calculations with rotations and transformations, some very smart people came up with the idea to add another column at the end to make calculations in a full transform matrix work. But I don't want to get too deep into this matrix stuff, because honestly, I don't really understand it. It's like trying to explain the plot of Inception to a drunk person. You're just going to confuse them even more. But the only thing that is important for us is that we need to zero these values out in order to make our matrix work. To be precise, we need to zero only the first three ones. The last one has to remain at one. To do that, we only need a little function that can access these components of a matrix directly. So to change the component, we need the setComp function and specify a certain value in our matrix. The inputs are, of course, our matrix, then the value we want, the row and column where to change the component. To visualize that, let's quickly look at the matrix like this, so you understand what's going on. This is how our matrix is described. It has four rows and four columns, starting from zero, and ending at 3. It's almost like my night outs in my 20s. The values are just samples, but we have a 1 at the end of the fourth column, and we need to zero out the first three rows. Filling in our set comp function, we need the M as our matrix, the 0 for our value, another 0 for our first row, and a 3 for the last column. We need to copy and paste that another two times, and change only the row to 1 for the second and 2 for the third one. If we now bind that back to an actual attribute, we can check if everything is working. It's actually not working because we can't use the name M for the attribute because we already used it for the matrix variable. It's like trying to name your kid the same thing as your dog. It's confusing and it just doesn't work. So we'll just rename it as MTRX instead. Now we notice right away we changed the value form from one to zero in order for us to make the matrix work. Now comes the great moment where we will check if we moved our object to the origin we just copy our wrangler from here where we already have our vex line with the inverting function, and we see that it is not working. Now every point is at the origin in this because we need to update our inverted matrix here from X form to the new MTRX, 
and everything is good. Except, we can see now that we actually described our axis in a way that rotated our object upside down. That is what I talked about earlier. We can update that really fast when we swap the order of the points where we subtract the one from another. But we need to update at least two of them. Otherwise we have weird normals like here. I try some value here myself until I have the right combination. Let's copy another wrangle where we multiply our matrix without the inverted version to bring it finally back to its initial position. But first we take the correct version here that we modeled last time and let's assume we did that in the right spot. Like that seems to be good here. Now grab the last attribute transfer and transfer our matrix values over, uncheck primitives and grab on the points the MTRX. Connect the transfer node with the wrangle and see that it doesn't work of course. We need to update the matrix attribute if we just copy some nodes. And finally we merge them quickly with the entire object. Like throwing a bunch of puzzle pieces into a blender and hoping they come out as a cohesive picture. Congratulations, you just set up your own matrix using three different axes and a center. I hope this was helpful for you. See you next time.